George, you have been in the telecom industry for over 32 years. How did you start your journey? Well, I actually went to university and did an IT degree. Um, I graduated in 1987 and was looking for a job in IT. Now, I was actually the first IT graduate in the UK. I was looking to work in programming because my degree was made up of maths, physics, engineering and computer science. And I really enjoyed programming. So I was looking for a job uh, as a programmer and British Telecom or BT were, had created a software center in Belfast and were recruiting the sort of top five or 10 graduates out of the engineering, maths and computer science faculties every year as they built up that software engineering capability. So in 1987, as a, a raw graduate, I went in and started writing code on network management systems and network management. Uh, and that's how I got started on my career in IT uh, and also on my career in telecoms. Okay. okay. Yeah. And um, what people, events or opportunities uh, played the role in shaping your career? Well, there was a number of things. Um, as I was working as a programmer, I, I moved into the area of charging and charge auditing. and we then were trying to redevelop our billing capability within BT. And uh, this was in 1991. And they were looking for somebody to join the billing design team who understood how charging worked. And obviously, I'd been working in charge auditing, so I fitted the criteria. So I got the opportunity to take on this massive billing transformation. There was two of us worked on the project. We were completely out of our depth. We were shooting well above our pay grade in terms of coming up with ideas to move pricing and billing off the switches and onto Unix boxes. We did a design on the back of an envelope and decided we needed 10 Unix boxes because we worked out we could process a thousand calls per second and price them. And uh, we just developed and designed the system to do that, and we deployed it nine months later by building it out of the software engineering center that we were part of in Belfast. And that just established my credentials as a designer. Uh, I then took that knowledge and experience and started to work on bigger design projects and then eventually started to move into architectural projects. And I think there was two or three key moments in my career. One is I got the opportunity to work on what was a joint venture between BT and AT&T that we were setting up to build a global JV. Uh, and I was responsible for all of the billing architecture and design. Uh, I spent three years, traveled backwards and forwards between Belfast, London and New Jersey and did 36 trips to the US in three years. And, and became the person that understood how billing and payment could be architected and designed not only within BT, but also then in a joint venture and partnership with AT&T. That opened up the opportunity to just thinking about bigger problems. And I took that opportunity when that role finished to come back to BT and took on the role of chief architect of our retail division, um, and was responsible then for the, the first Siebel CRM introduction uh, in the UK. And at, at one point in time, I think it was the biggest Siebel installation in the world. Um, and, and that was you know, really a pivotal point in my career as I was moving away from developer and then design into architecture and actually being responsible for the architecture for initially a line of business and then ultimately for the entire organization within BT. When you worked at BT, you were an active contributor to the TM Forum member project and also even appointed at the TM Forum Distinguished Fellow. Uh, what impact did that have on your career and the skill developments? Well, the very interesting thing was, you know, whenever you worked in an organization, you thought that the problems that you were solving were unique to that organization. And it was actually through exposure on the TM Forum that I realized that actually every operator was facing the same problems that we were facing in BT, whether it was uh, technical debt, whether it was overly complex systems, whether it was legacy uh, mainframes or uh, distributed computing boxes that were sitting lying around that you had been building yourselves 
didn't quite know how they worked or weren't quite sure what they did or were afraid to touch them because they worked perfectly. So, George, you have been in the telecom industry for over 32 years. How did you start your journey? It was through the TM Forum that I had the opportunity to meet with my peers, people like Laurent Leboucher and Lester Thomas, who we all know, who are also actually distinguished fellows of the TM Forum, um, uh, and actually you know, share the sorts of problems we were grappling with in our own organizations, and then actually sit together and say, hang on a minute. There is an easier way of doing this. You know, for example, we had adopted an API first approach within BT. Uh, Laurent and Lester were doing similar things in Orange and Vodafone. And each of us had probably built the interface between customer management and billing, between product catalog and product ordering 10, maybe 15 times in our own organizations. We said, this is nonsensical. We should standardize this and develop an industry standard. And out of that was the genesis of the Open API project. And we started to build a common set of industry standard Open APIs. And that's really been transformational, not only for the organization that I was working in. So I got the real value of starting to adopt TM Forum industry standard APIs. But it's been transformational for our industry because it's simplified and sped up the integration. It's taken away an awful lot of the pain points and enable organizations not only to tackle technical debt, but to create new opportunities for growth, because these APIs actually expose business capabilities in an industry standard manner. So you can then use those capabilities whenever you go beyond the telco domain and actually start looking at IoT solutions. So smart health, smart home, smart manufacturing, they all need to do things like charging and identification and then you know, device management and so forth. And we've built a set of APIs that actually work in that space. That's amazing, the power of collaboration. And as the industry uh, transforms, we hear more and more about this uh, skill gap. What skills are we talking about? And uh, why is it, what's driving those um, new skills? So as I said, I joined BT in 1987 as a software engineer, as a programmer effectively. Uh, and learned how to develop and design databases, to build APIs, to write code, application code, and so forth. Over a period of time, many of the operators' architectures moved away to become COTS packages, commercial off-the-shelf packages. Mm -hmm. And the actual skills that the operators were valuing weren't software engineers because you weren't starting from scratch to write code. It actually became much more of a project management activity and procurement management, managing the vendors that sold the COTS packages, trying to beat them up on price, trying to squeeze as much value out of every contract as you could. And therefore, an awful lot of the technical skills, be it um, Java programming or database design uh, or whatever, were lost from the operators. As the architecture of the future has changed and we've moved more away from the COTS packages, though they're still an integral part of an architecture. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, what you need is the software engineering skills as we actually move back towards an architecture that has capability driven functions and has rules and products that are actually configurable from a catalog. And then you write the interpretation of the rules within the application. So organizations are actually having to go out and try and get those software engineering skills back into their DNA. And they're having to start from scratch very often and either recruit new graduates who've got the skills and get them working on the projects, or they're having to retrain individuals who are in the organization but haven't written code or haven't done configuration of applications for many, many years and having to reskill those people. So there's a real issue that an awful lot of those skills were devalued for a 10 to 15 year period, or they were offshored. So many of our subcontractors actually have those skills, but they're in the wrong time zone or the wrong location. And uh, therefore, we're seeing many of our members bringing those skills back in house and they're having to recruit to get them. Um, or they're having to form partnerships to actually acquire the skills in a different manner. But it's effectively the software engineering and software design skills 
that we're trying to get back into our organizations. Okay. And in your experience, what are the most effective ways to encourage people to acquire the new skills? Well, I think you have to value learning. So an organization that's not learning is actually moving backwards. So I would always encourage you know, the people that work with me to be curious, to be inquisitive, to actually find out about new technology. Find out, particularly if you're sitting in the TM forum, you know, you've got massive access to our members who are very willing to talk about the work that they're doing because they're very proud of that work. I just take time whenever you meet them at events, whenever you're talking to them on calls, uh, and actually see, will they share, you know, what are they doing? What are the problems they're solving? What does the technology enable them to do? And actually being curious. The other thing is there's also many opportunities through learning and development to get structured training. But that's only a small part of what you need. That gives you the basics, the foundations around the technical subject. The key thing is to actually put it into practice, start using the skills, the knowledge, test it with our members, you know, go and test your thinking, mm. speak to the members. They're always very, very happy to chat to you, particularly, you know, if you're at something like Accelerate, which we were just at two weeks ago, and you're having a conversation with a member um, over a cup of coffee in one of the breaks, and you're asking about what are they doing with 5G and slice management. If that's an area they're working on, you know, you'll easily fill the coffee break talking about the technology and sharing your experience, your knowledge and, and checking your knowledge with them. And then obviously, as we build solutions on our collaborative projects, you can actually see the technology being put into practice and you can actually learn from what the new standards are that we're developing. And that then enriches your knowledge and experience around the subject. So it's one of those continuous learning activities that I always would say, you know, don't stop learning. You're never too old to learn something new uh, and, and keep like sucking it in like a sponge absorbs water. Just take knowledge on board. You never know when it's going to be useful. OK, excellent. And if you have not pursued your career, your current career, what would it be? What would you do instead? Well, I've often thought that I would love to be a, a scrap car dealer. Um, oh, really? Actually, <laughs> yeah, I just love cars and I just uh, I love keeping cars on the road and being able to take cars and to professionally dismantle cars, to package all of the goods and, and, and parts associated with the cars after you've thoroughly checked them and then have those for sale at a reduced price for those people that are trying to maintain a car, or keep a car on the road. I just think it's it, it looks and sounds like a fascinating business uh, and it's something completely different from Telco that I would have. Would, would quite like to have done, though I suspect it's probably fairly hard work and fairly dirty work and it wouldn't allow me to wear the suit and tie that I was often familiar and known for in the telecoms industry. Yeah, it's still an engineering though to some extent, right? <laughs> it's still engineering. I'm probably an engineer at heart, Anna. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, George. Thank no you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah.